Hello friends, Steve from Southern Illinois and it's downright nippy today. Down in the low 30s, that's close to zero That for those of you that live in Celsius world. <sighs> and the neighbors are raking their leaves and burning them. <sighs> and I'm shivering. Have you ever felt dirty? Have you ever been dirty? I'm not talking every day. Oh, I've got a smudge on my face kind of dirty. I'm, I'm talking the, the head to toe, up your nose, down your pants, in your pockets, under your fingernails, that kind of dirty. Okay? As a boy, my childhood was spent in New Mexico, Kansas, Jamaica, and it didn't matter where I was. My mother claimed that her boys, I and my brother, were the dirtiest kids in the world. It didn't matter what we were doing. Playing baseball, playing soccer, football for you Jamaicans, um, <clears throat> hide and seek, tag, digging for buried treasure. Okay, we could get dirty anywhere. And then when c would come mom's call, Yoo-hoo! Good old 50s uh, hailing uh, call. And we knew it was time for supper. And we would come trapezing into the house and mom would holler from the kitchen, go wash up, boys. And my brother and I would rush into the bathroom and fight over who got the soap and the water first. But eventually both of us would get our hands all soaped up and we would rub them up and down our arms up to the elbows. That was important. And we would wash our faces and then reach around trying to find the water so that we could rinse the soap off of our faces. And then we would rush to the bedroom and put on sh fresh shirts so mom couldn't see the rivulets running down our chests and back where we hadn't washed. And then we, <coughs> then we, there was a mad dash to get to the bed get to the kitchen table and get our favorite chair. But invariably, when we would arrive, Mom would say, Did you wash behind your ears, boys? Yes, Mom. Let me see. And she would pull back my ear. Now, you have to understand that one of my nicknames in elementary school was Dumbo. I had these ears that stuck out and were just enormous. And it was so embarrassing when mom would touch them, and pull them back, and she would say, you call this washed? And she would rub her finger behind my, my ear, and she'd pull it out, and there would be mud on her finger. I had washed there. And I would complain, Mom, I already washed. And she would say, doesn't matter, Steve. Back to, the, back to the bathroom. Wash behind your ears. Washing up was a very real touchstone in the lives of the people in the Bible. It sounds funny, doesn't it? I mean, to us, it's a normal part of life, but part of a spiritual life? In the New Testament, there were two Greek words that are used in the, the Bible to describe this washing up. One was nipto. Nipto was washing part of the body, washing your hands, washing your face, washing your feet, didn't matter what part, that was nipto. And in the spiritual lives of the Jews, Nipto was a preventive measure. It was something you did when you weren't sure you were impure. You weren't sure you had touched something you shouldn't have. You weren't sure you had done something wrong. But you wanted to just be safe. And so you'd wash your face, wash your hands. When you would enter a house, a servant would wash your feet. Before a meal, a servant would come around and pour water over your hands while another servant held a basin to catch the water. It was important that it be running water when you were niptoing. And before a good Jew 
prayed to God. He would wash his hands. He would wash his face. He would wash his feet. So that when he came before God, he was pure. Baptizo was an entirely different thing. Baptizo, from which we get the word baptism, meant washing the entire body. There was no doubt about what baptizo meant. You immersed your body in the water. You didn't do a little part here and a little part here until you got everything done. No, you had to get down in the water. And baptizo was re reserved for those times when either you were sure you had been in contact with something you shouldn't have, or when it was really important to be pure. And so if you had been in the crowded marketplace and perfect strangers were bumping into you and rubbing in on you, and when you came home, you baptized. When you went to the synagogue, there were, and, and, or to the temple, there were private bathtubs for people to baptizo themselves before going into worship. And all of the very conscientious conservative Jews baptizoed before every worship service. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Gentiles were a special case. A Gentile, okay? A Jew could become impure, dirty, by association, by contact, by what they did. But a Gentile was born dirty. And so when a Gentile wished to convert to Christianity, a Gentile underwent not only circumcision, but baptism as well. R repentance and washing were woven into the spiritual culture of the Jews. But John the Baptist took it a step further. He declared that everyone was dirty. Everyone needed baptism. Whether they were Jew or Gentile, the good, the bad, the ugly, young, old, everyone needed to be baptized, to be reborn, to live newly. And that everyone included the people in church. The people who thought they were good. The people who thought they were already a part of the kingdom. But John said, no, unless you repent and are baptized, you are not a part of the kingdom. No wonder they looked askance at him. I mean, he changed the question from, have you ever been dirty or are you dirty? To a declaration, you are dirty. People in church were understandably upset. I mean, who do you, who are you to declare that I am dirty? Us? We're the good guys. Why are you accusing us? And when a few of them finally caved in and said, well, okay, if you really think this is important, <laughs> they came to baptism kicking and screaming just like I did when my mom sent me back to wash behind my ears. And my mom, she was gentle. When she would say, go wash it again, I would say, Mom, but I already did. And she said, it doesn't matter. Do it again. <laughs> John was a lot less tactful. He said, you brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? To him, baptism was not a ritual. It didn't usher you into a church. It wasn't a membership 
hazing. It was a symbol, a symbol of an experience, an experience of deep repentance, of turning your life around, choosing a different path, uh, abandoning the past, uh, choosing a new star to direct your, direct your paths. After Jesus ate his last Passover, he assumed the role of a servant and began washing his disciples. When he came to Peter, Peter refused. Now, I've heard people speculate that he refused because he didn't want he was embarrassed that Jesus was humbling himself or he was upholding the honor of his master. But you know, I think he was kind of like me as a boy coming to supper. I didn't feel particularly dirty. And it kind of offended me that mom made a big deal about washing behind my ears. I don't think Peter felt dirty. I mean, after all, this they had just eaten the Passover meal. And before the Passover meal, they had all purified themselves. What is Jesus communicating when now he's coming around and washing their feet? Was Jesus accusing them of being impure? When Peter finally caved in and said, okay, okay, if you insist, he characteristically swung to the other extreme. But if you're going to wash my feet, wash all of me. Don't just nipto me. If I'm dirty, baptizo me. And I could see Jesus just kind of smirking as he gently says, no, Peter. You're clean. You just need nipto. You just need to wash up. It's easy for symbols to take on a life of their own. Christians embraced washing up as a touchstone of the spiritual life in many forms. Okay, Most of us are familiar with baptism. Although for some of us, the original, the original meaning of immersion has, has been lost. But did you know that up until the time of the Reformation, cathedrals that were built in Europe had a fountain in the vestibule of the church where worshipers were expected to wash their face and wash their hands and wash their feet? before they entered into the church to worship. Even today, across large swatches of Africa and Asia, churches are built that way. You wash before you enter the church. And it, not only in the church, it, in, it, is, it is extended into the home before you pray at home, you wash your hands, your, your, hands, your face, and, and your feet. Yet for all of our embracing of the symbols of washing up in Christianity, if John the Baptist stood up in church today proclaiming, You're dirty! Repent! Be baptized! How many of us would react like the Pharisees. Us? You, you're saying we need repentance? Just like the Gentiles, those sinners on the street? Really? Can Christians be so arrogant as to think that they can honestly look in the mirror and say, there is no sin present within us. Infidelity, dishonesty, lying, cheating, divorce, sexual abuse, wife beating, criminal behavior, all of these are as, as common and frequent inside churches as they are outside. That's been demonstrated repeatedly.
them is us. Us is them. I know it's not good grammar, okay? But both John and Paul had it right. It is as true today as it is when they preached it. All are sinners. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And all need to bring forth the works of repentance. That's what baptism was about. It wasn't about getting dunked. It was about changing your life. The ritual of baptism may only be required in Christianity once. But in reality, it's an experience that extends a lifetime right up until we walk into the kingdom. But here the words of Jesus bring me hope and comfort. Like Peter, I associate baptism and repentance with being really bad, really dirty, despicable. But when Peter asked to be washed all over in response to Jesus' insistence, I see Jesus smirking as he gently says to, to Peter, Peter, you're already clean. All you need is to go wash behind your ears. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I hope to see you next week.